There you go. Okay. So I guess I'll start with, um, it's pretty much just a basic photo gallery of the build. I'll go through a bit of, I guess my process in research, I guess, um, for making the paludarium, but it's not very in depth because I didn't really take that many process photos, unfortunately, but I'll, if there's any questions, I can answer them. Thanks. Um, so yeah, I was trying to decide between either doing a paludarium or terrarium for my orchids or the orchids that I wanted. Um, I eventually went towards the paludarium route because I wanted some kind of water feature and I figured it'd be easier for me in the long run since it, it would have sitting water. I wouldn't have to keep checking on whether or not the misters would have water access or other problems that could arise. So it's all pretty much like a set and forget type of setup. So yeah. I went, oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Um, so yeah, um, I started with like looking at Instagram images or like Google images for like inspiration, how to, I guess, um, escape the actual paludarium that I wanted to build. Um, so these are just a few examples of what I was looking at. Um, pretty general idea of my direction. I liked it. I liked things that were more, I guess, heavily planted and very green. Um, but I also like the openness that some of them had. Um, maintain the water part and keep it clean. Um, yeah, so I'll get into this step now, I guess. Um, so for the water part, it's I set it up for like an, I guess like an organic type of filter. So it, I have a water pump in there, but it's flowing over a bunch of moss, which will um, filter out any large particles in the water that if there's anything in there. So it kind of acts like as a, a secondary or primary type of filter. And it also takes out any excess nutrients from the water. So there's no excess green or like algae blooms in it. I also have aquatic plants in there to help take those nutrients up as well. In case the fertilizer from the orchids um, goes into the water. Um, yeah, so then trying to water the orchids. Um, I'm using a felt or like a moisture wicking material which I have up here on the top uh, right. It's the Terra tape. I'm, you can probably use any other um, fabric. I just used this because it was already at the shop that I was shopping at. But you can essentially have it wrap around pieces of driftwood and it will, um, part of it will sit in the water so it will help um, wake up the water to the orchids that would be okay with sitting in um, fairly moist conditions. Um, and then lighting, I went with the one from Amazon. Um, it's the Chihiro's 2, I think. But I chose this one just because it was, um, it's all controlled on my phone and I can set it to have a um, a day, I guess, setting. So it would ramp up, it would dim up to its full power. And then at the end of the day, it would dim down to like a sunset type of um, light. So it seems like a more natural way of lighting the whole tank. Um, so yeah, this is pretty much where we started figuring out where I wanted to place all the um, components or like the 
the solid parts of the aquarium or paludarium, sorry. Um, it's just to give me a better idea of where I could put plants and then making sure I'm buying things um, um, within reason, I guess. And this is like the first couple of days of setting it up. Um, I don't have the organs in yet. Um, they came in like a day after this, but I wanted to set up everything within this, the like water part before I put in the orchids. So this was a good way to get it all set up. Um, and then this is the orchids in. Um, I changed it around a bit from this point just to um, just because I noticed that there was lighting issues or some orchids were getting too much light or some not getting enough. So I played around with those a bit. Um, I also noted noticed that I was having humidity issues and having it being consistent. So I had to make a lid for it. So I went with an acrylic lid. So I made this one. Um, it's slightly smaller at the top, so it doesn't sit flush, which allows for like an air gap to um, have like airflow within the tank. So then I don't have to worry about opening or like having fans up to make sure the orchids aren't like always in 100% humidity. Um, so yeah, like I said earlier, for the light cycle for my tank, um, it's 10 hours on, um, just because in the room that I have it in, there is a lot of ambient bright light as well. So then I didn't want to, um, I guess, over saturate the tank. And then, yeah, some of the blooms that happened. These were all pretty much within the, the first two months. Um, I might have issues later on in the summer or if it gets warmer in the room later on, just because some of the limp head days are like more cool, um, I guess, loving orchids. So I will probably eventually get a mister or like one of those cooling misters that um, will help keep temperatures down. And then I have a few other plants as well. I mean, some of them are jewel orchids, which are more terrestrial, but they're good with like the high moisture um, in the certain areas as well as some like Lucifalandra, some Margravia, um, and then a couple other um, small ferns. Um, and then, yeah, this is in the water. So then I have like little cherry shrimp. They have a really small bio load. So then whatever they're, I guess, eating, which is mostly like pollen leaves from the orchids or anything else, or the, sorry, or from the driftwood. So then they're actually kind of helping with the nitrogen cycle and keeping the tank a little bit more happy. And yeah, um, this was like two weeks ago, I guess. Um, the dendrobium will probably come out in like two, three months when it's out of its wet phase. So then once it starts going to the deciduous part or deciduous like a cycle, I'll take it out and figure out where to put that in eventually. Can you keep a yeah. goldfish in there? <laughs> no. <laughs> I was thinking about adding fish, okay. but I wasn't sure. Yeah. Okay. Could have poison dart frogs. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, over the top. Yeah. Goldfish Jonathan do you have a fan or anything to move the air in there? No, I don't. Um, 
I just have like the opening for the lid. Uh -huh. um, and that seems to be doing enough for airflow. What is your night day temperature differential? Because that's one of the issues people have with terrariums is the temperature doesn't change very much. Yeah, um, it's like a five degree change, which isn't a lot, but it seems to be doing okay for these. Very nice. <clears throat> Any other questions? John, thank you for doing this, for preparing it and taking the time. It's really nice to share. No problem. Yeah, I wanted to ask, was I wanted to ask Jonathan, how big, how big is that tank? A 30 gallon? And maybe I missed what you said about the size oh. of the tank. Oh, I forgot to say that. Um, it's a 10 gallon, so it's okay. pretty small. Okay, so where do you keep your plants when they're not in here? You like sounds like you switch them out and stuff. So where do you grow them when they're not in your tank? In your paludarium? This is, well, oh. I have a rack of um, plants. Well, so, it, sorry, I have a rack of plants, but this is the first time I'm experimenting like with a wet cycle for uh -huh. most of the plants. So I don't know where I'm gonna put those. <laughs> Jonathan, I yes. used to uh, raise uh, dendrobatid frogs, poison dart frogs for many years in an yeah. aquarium set up something like this, but it was more primitive and we had a humidifier, a, a mister. But one of the things that we used were these little computer fans very small one that's on the back of computers to blow small amounts of air in there. And that kept down the algae and mosses that we didn't want. So that's something if you get into trouble later on with that kind of a problem, the air movement works really well. Right, yeah, Just to good keep. to know. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah. Beautiful. <clears throat> it's Hello. impressive and actually, Good to have a list of the orchids that thrive in this climate. Chlorothalids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the panthes are good choices because they seem to do. I knew somebody was really into them, and that, that's all they grew. And they were growing in a terrarium like situation, and they did really well. Um, so that's something that even if you specialized, um, it's kind of fun to experiment to see what works. But um, lepanthes, when you find them in the wild, it's often pretty still air. Like they're often then deep in the bushes and you have to hunt for them. And so, you know, like not a lot of air movement is needed. And it seems perfect for these, the paludarium. And they seem to be all like when you find them, you find several species growing together, but sometimes not a lot of other stuff. So, oh, interesting. I didn't know that. But yeah, I, expand, I experimented with this a bit because I didn't know a whole lot about orchids coming to this. This is actually my second terrarium that I have a couple orchids in. Um, but after talking to some people at one of the past orchid shows, they steered me into this direction. So I was like pretty happy with how this is turning out. Um, so I can say that I think with this kind of, cause I've had marine fish and, and I know Ernie's had marine and freshwater and, and reptiles and amphibians and all these things. Um, I think the bigger the setup you have, the better off you are because the, of less fluctuation in conditions. So you can never do this on a bigger scale. I'm not saying take over your house but or your apartment, but yeah, just the bigger things are, the less the fluctuation and the more um, seems to work better that way. Yeah, for sure. Eventually they'll go that way, but yeah. I don't have that much work yet. Right, it catches. Very cool. So Lynn, are you? I'm ready. All right, you're ready. Let's see here. So I'm switching, switching over. Let, so we're gonna click. Sorry, I hit the wrong thing. Your turn. <laughs> okay. I'll try to get it right today. There we go. You're a pro at this, Lynn. Don't worry about it. Success. What do you see? A pink 
<laughs> Something. That's my screen. Epi. Is it Epi? Epi. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Do you see it now? Yes. Okay, so uh, Ron, we've got what a half an hour till you're on. So we have sorry. another gorgeous, gorgeous show and tell table tonight. We have 60 stunning orchids from 20 contributors, and we'll get started. I the order in which they're shown is the order in which I receive them. So Nancy Tristan is the early bird. She shows off, starts us off with a mystery. Uh, the plant tag on this says it's Sarcochylus falcatus, but Nancy said she was informed that the large white flower form of Sarcochylus falcatus was recently described as Sarconivius, having a less colorful labellum and a much larger flower. J. Fal does not show a Sarconivius, but um, Q's International Plant Names Index does show a reference to it with no further description. Ron, does any, anybody else know? Um, I, I have to say um, that there's a lot of splitting going on with Australian stuff. So the Australians feel they're all separate, like Sarcocalus, um Cecilia has a bunch of variants, but they're sometimes elevated. So it just depends on interpretation. I, I don't see there's anything but a, but a Falcatus and I've seen thousands of them in the wild, so. Um, so you're happy with Falcatus? Yeah. Already. Dale Martin just received on June 7th an award of merit on this. This is Paphilo Nighthawk. Um, he gave it the clonal name of Austin Creek, which is his nursery name. It's a beautiful showing with three beautifully symmetrical forward facing flowers. It's a cross of Path Wayne Booth by Path Aductum, variety and item. And as we can see, it's about 40% Roth, which gives a lot of the coloration and the lovely ribbon like petals. So, congratulations to Dale on this AM. Uh, this is Dale's Dendrobium sanderi. It's a species endemic to the mountains of Luzon Island in the Philippines. The flowers are long lived, they're crystalline white, and they're large up to about four inches. This is actually an alba form uh, because the typical form, which you see in the bottom right, is marked with plummy purple parallel stripes in the lip, which we don't see in, in Dale's plant. It's a cool grower, it needs moderate light levels and a drier rest during the winter a very rewarding plant for any collection. This is Dale's Lelia tenebrosa, the name meaning dark Lelia, though the taxonomists are currently designating this as Catlea tenebrosa. This is a large Brazilian species. Its habitat has been probably totally destroyed to the extent that it may be extinct in nature, but fortunately it's found pretty widely in cultivation and many of us grow it in our collections. It needs quite bright light to, to initiate blooms and it grows successfully in intermediate to cool temperatures. This is Dale's Pafloei, a species native to Borneo and Malaysia, where it appears to be epiphytic and lithophytic and terrestrial because wherever it grows, its roots are buried in deep moss or leaf litter or hummus near water up to about 4,500 feet of elevation. This is an important multifloral path because uh, it's used widely in hybridizing for its size, its color, and its floriferousness. Dale offers um, other path species and hybrids on his website, Austin Creek Orchids website, if you want to check that out. Lynn, can I say something? Of course. Yeah, so I, I di didn't know it was from Malaysia, but I have heard that it's been found on Palawan, the connecting island off of the uh, southeast of the Philippines, part of the Philippines, mm -hmm. but what leads Philippines to Borneo. So I, I believe Jim, my friend Jim Coots will be on from Australia. Pretty sure that and he's been doing a lot of Palawan Boring, finding all kinds of new species. I think, I don't know about the Malaysia part, but I know that I'm pretty sure it's from Palawan. Also. Okay, thank you. It grows in the, in the Malaysian part of Borneo. So maybe that's uh, where the Malaysian. That's what it, yeah. Andrea Lodate shows us Pleione Tangariro. This is uh, the first hybrid Pleione I've seen and it's just as charming as the species are as you, that you see in the background there. It's a cross of Pleione Versailles by Pleione Pleonoides. These are Chinese cool growing terrestrial orchids. Uh, they must have cool to cold winter nights with very little water for several months. Uh, they're not the easiest to bloom, at least for me. So congratulations on this, Andrea. It's very lovely. Thank you. This is Andrea's Catlea Tokyo Magic crossed with Cat Laughing Boy. This is an unregistered hybrid with a lovely peach blush on the petals and a gorgeous lip. As you can see, it has many stellar Catleas in its genealogy, including Dawiana, which contributes to the um, beautiful markings on the, that long frilly lip. This is David Shee's tall Mazdavalia, 
which has unfortunately lost its, unfortunately lost its ID tag. Mastivalia is a genus which as a whole are cool to cool cold growers that do best with a fine mix in pots. They like low light, high humidity and watering throughout the year, but be careful not to overwater them. Mastivalia is a new world genus of about 600 species and they're found from Mexico to the Southern Andes. David's is probably a hybrid, hybrid with maybe Vecchiana, but that long sturdy stem makes for a very showy flower. Paxinia. This is David's Dracula marsupialis. And the notes on this says that the name refers to the pouched lip, which is like a kangaroo would have. Not the lip, the pouch. <laughs> it's native to the wet cloud forest of Northeast Ecuador, around 7,000 feet. So it prefers cool to cold nighttime temperatures and low light. It has long tail sepals reaching down to the base of David's thumb. Uh, Draculas do best in baskets like David is using here because the inflorescences emerge from the bottom of the plant and they can come out through the holes. Otherwise they get hung up inside of pots. The flowers are downward facing. So the pot really needs to be hung high on Dracula so you can have flowers that don't touch the ground and you can see them. These are good for outdoors in the Bay Area on a covered deck. That is a beautiful monkey face. This is Tom Pickford's Dendrobium trichinopus, the name referring to the triangular column foot of the flower. It's a species native to Southeast Asia, including the mountains of Northern Thailand, where it's found at about 5,000 feet of elevation. The flowers are long lasting about two to three months. They're waxy, they're fragrant, they're about two inches, and they arise from the nodes of both leafless and leafy canes. This plant needs to dry completely between waterings in late winter until new growths arise in the spring. It's a great photo, Tom. This is Tom's Cattleya, formerly Lelia Cincarana, growing on a tree fern mast. Uh, this is a Brazilian dryland species, which does best mounted so it can dry quickly between watering. It likes very bright light, good air movement. The plant's only three or four inches and the flowers are typically three to four inches, but Tom has a particularly large bloom on this plant, closer to five inches. You can see he had just watered it before taking the photo. The lip has five keels or ridges down the center to direct the pollinator to the prize within. This is Tom's Cattleya or Lelia rubin. This is a primary hybrid of Lelia syncorana, which we just saw, and Lelia purpurata. Uh, Cattleya rubin comes in a wide range of colors depending on the color of the purpurata that's used in the cross. Here, Tom says the purpurata used was the sanguinea form, which is a very dark magenta to purple form of purpurata. We can see that the small size of the Sincarana plant has reduced the size of the stately large purpurata to a more manageable size, this gorgeous color. This is Tom's Prostachia marii. It's had several other names, um, hanging in his greenhouse in Bolinas. When Tom emailed these photos to me, spell check changed the subject line on this one to prosthesis marii. Ooh, that was good for my daily chuckle. This species is found in dry oak forests in Mexico between 3,000 and 4,000 feet, where the winter nights are in the mid 40s, even occasionally freezing. So this is a good Bay Area outdoor candidate, protected because it does prefer uh, three months with very little water in the winter. The flowers are three to four inches across, they're really large for the size of the plant, and they're dominated by that large crepe papery lip. Larry Robert shows a Cypripedium acale. Larry recently returned from visiting his parents in Minnesota, where they have a cabin with a lake and some bog a bit south of Duluth. He timed his trip for when the wild lady slipper orchids were going to be blooming there. And despite a heat wave, quite a few were still in bloom. And he's sharing his photos with us here. So these are not ones that he grew. This Cypripedia macaulay is characterized by the inflated pouch with a longitudinal fissure, fissure running down the, uh, the front of it. I clicked on the link that Larry sent me along with the photos and it read, read with interest that, quote, some have called this lady slipper the scrotum flower. Mm -hmm. And before anyone is too alarmed, just ask any man who's had an orchidectomy. Close quotes. <laughs> Another of Larry's photos of Cypripedium macaulay. Um, Cypripediums are almost impossible to establish in cultivation, and this one is not available at all commercially. 
The photo shows that the upper flower is developing a seed pod and it's probably pollinated by a, a large bumblebee that gets inside and has to bump around inside. And, and uh, if they find their way out, um, they quickly learn from experience and they avoid these flowers in the future. So uh, the article said they're dependent on naive bees and therefore they're generally experienced pretty low pollination rates. This is Judy Carney's Cattleya maxima growing in her intermediate greenhouse in Petaluma. It's a species from Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, and there are two distinct populations of maxima. Uh, it was originally discovered in the hot, humid lowlands around Guayaquil, Ecuador. Later, it was found at high elevations on the western slopes of the Andes up to about 7,000 feet. The lowland plants are among the largest of the unifoliate cats, and they can have 12 or more flowers, whereas the upland maxima plants are smaller, harsher conditions, so smaller, uh, more rugged plants, and they usually have just three to five fl flowers. Of course, the maximas we see in our collections are hybridized for size, vigor, floriferousness. What they all have in common is that characteristic yellow um, stripe radi radiating out from the throat. These are gorgeous. This is Judy's Dendrobium bensonii. This is a species found in India and Burma, and it's named after an English officer and orchid enthusiast in Burma and the Burma in the 1800s. It's medium sized, warm to cool growing, um, epiphytic, it's deciduous and it blooms on leafless canes as you can see in, in Judy's photo. The, the flowers are about two and a half inches and they're characterized by those two magenta spots at the back of the lip. Uh, and they are fragrant, it grows well uh, down into the low 40s at night and it wants much less winter water in the winter. This is a spectacular blooming of Phalaenopsis lobii from Judy. Uh, it's a great candidate for a cultural award with this many flowers, beautifully arrayed around this nearly leafless uh, Phalaenopsis. The flowers are crystalline, they're about an inch. They have a light citrus fragrant. And this species is found in the Eastern Himalayas, fairly low elevations. It needs just two to four month cool drier rest period with increased winter light levels, just an occasional misting. So applause for this one, Judy. There we go. Oh, Lynn, that's actually uh, Parishii. It's the office Parishii. It's Parishii? Yeah, lobby has got like a root beer brown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the yellow, uh, like a distinct yellow on it. This, they're very similar. Yeah, very yeah, cool. yeah. Yeah, Judy, change your tag. <laughs> Cute faces. I think Erno shows us her. Oh, never mind. What, Judy? Plants. I got this plant from Petite Plaisance when they very first imported it. So not a lot of people had it. And they all came in, I guess, as lobii. And so the original tag was on it. And uh, I see that now that you say that, Ron. Thanks. Thanks, Judy. Heidi Arno shows us her Hocoglossum rupestre crossed with Aspocentrum Christensonianum. This is a hybrid that recently has been registered by Peter T. Lynn as Vandoglossum pear blossom. Heidi got this cute little miniature Vanda from Peter Lynn when he was our speaker here at SFOS a few months ago. She's delighted that it has three flowers now and her thumb shows just how tiny the flowers are. Deborah Vells Qualter says this is her husband's orchid. And she says it's very small, very fragrant. Does anyone know the name? Calcaea phalaenopsis. Okay. Got it, Deborah? Calcaea is spelled C A U C A E A. And the species is phalaenopsis, like the genus phalaenopsis. I wrote it down, Deborah. So if, if you have any questions, you can ask me. Thank you, Ron. Deborah also shows us her late blooming Cymbidium hybrid looking gorgeous in the garden, surrounded by ferns and aeonium. It's a pretty presentation. Stuart Meneker shows us this complex cat lay hybrid, Sacramento Ruby Red Knight. This is a little mini cat made by Alan Koch in 2002. We can see there's some, if you look at the uh, genealogy, you can see there's some uh, big tenebrosa in the background, but Alan has used small cat layers like Coccinia, Bradii, and Milleri to bring down the size. And of course, the vibrant color comes from the Sophronitis uh, coccinia. It's a great windowsill candidate for those of you that are looking for small plants. It just needs medium to bright light, likes a wide range of temperatures, 
and it's just plain adorable. Stuart bought this from Gold Country Orchids last year at POE. This is its first bloom. Roberta Fox has some unusual plants to show us tonight. This is Loaf Grenianthus Blanche Amesii. This is a rare monotypic genus from Brazil. It's a twig epiphyte with a name bigger than the flower, which is about three quarters of an inch. The flowers are pendant, as you can see, so you need to turn the plant over to see the, the detail of the beautiful little flowers. Roberta says she grows it outside on her Costa Mesa, uh, coastal Orange County patio, shady and damp. Roberta specializes on unusual species, and here's another one, Polycenus and Nectans. This is a species from Ecuador at elevations of five to 6,000 feet, found in dense wet forests on the eastern slopes of the Andes. The elevation data indicates that it should be able to grow on the cool side, but Roberta says it does much better in the greenhouse with intermediate conditions. Jay Fowles notes indicate that Polycenus differs from Cycnoches in the flowers being hermaphroditic, meaning both the male and the female parts are carried on the, the flower in Polycenus, where so, Cycnoches have separate male and female. Lynn? Yeah. So that's so polycyclic is interesting means many swans because of the curved columns on it. Oh yeah. And then it's actually a, a close relative of Gongora. That's in the Stanhope and I. Yeah, yeah. Stanhope and I. Cool, thank you. Roberta shows us Microcelia stolzii. As you can see, this is a leafless and gray quaid orchid from uh, much of central and eastern Africa, elevations from 2,700 up to 11,000 feet. So it's quite cold tolerant. It's best mounted or hanging out of a basket as Roberta shows it here, because the roots, because it is leafless, the roots do all of the photosynthesis and they need to be exposed to the light or the plant will starve to death. Roberta grows it on her patio, shady, damp. The flowers are about a quarter of an inch and she says they're heather scented. That's a beautiful job, beautiful. This is Roberta's Alemania punicia. This is another monotypic genus, meaning that this is the one and only species in the genus. It's endemic to southern, the genealogists won't put up with that for long, they'll move it somewhere to Ketlea probably. It's endemic to southern Mexico, where it's found in um, high woodland, wooded mountains from five to 6,500 feet of elevation. Can take temperatures in the low 40s, so this is a good candidate to grow outdoors in the Bay Area. Protected with filtered or diffused light, Roberta grows hers in bright shade on her patio in Costa Mesa. And it, she says it's a member of the Ketley Alliance. It, real quickly, Lynn, I'm sorry, sorry to keep interrupting. That's interesting because oh, like it, that. it's, um, it's a species, not only is it monotypic, but it also is one of the few uh, Lely and I, which it makes a growth and then it flowers off the side on a separate growth. It doesn't bloom on a terminal inflorescence like almost everything else. There's a few exceptions, Ketley Walker and a Billier. A few epidendrums, including Stamfordianum and Laterali, and this Alemannia. It's very few species in the Lelianae that bloom laterally off the base of a bowl. Off the face, okay. The, 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 it's off hard the base, to see it off, here, yeah. Off to the side of the, of the bowl, yeah. Great, thank you. Larry White and Roy Wyman show us Paphiopedalum Petite Paradise. This is a cross that was registered by Dave Sorkowski of Path Paradise in 2020 and it's unawarded to date. It has three great Brachypetalum species in the parentage as Nivium, Godefroy, and Bellotulum. And I think this is a striking flower, it shows very good qualities of all the three parents. So I think we'll be watching this on the judging table as it, as it grows up. This is Larry and Roy's Mysticidium capens, one of the most widespread species, that's hard to say, found in South Africa. The species favors hot, dry conditions, frequently found in acacia woodland and brush um, habitat where few other epiphytic orchids occur. And it's also found on succulent euphorbia trees. Larry and Roy grow this beautifully on a windowsill in their home. The flowers are about an inch across with a nectary or spur that's about two and a half inches long. And it is night fragrant, so it's likely pollinated by a night moth. And Larry and Roy's uh, Guarechia indigo blue. Uh, this used to be Epicatlianthi. Larry and Roy's black comet is a cross of Guarianthi or Catlea boringiana and Prosthecia 
uh, cochleata, which more of us are familiar with. It was just registered by Peter T. Lynn last year. It has no awards to date. The deep mauve coloring of the sepals and petals and the black purple lip with the radiating white veins are really striking. This is a, also a good candidate for windowsill growers and the flowers are quite long lasting. <clears throat> this is Dave Hermeyer's Mastavalia schlimii, an intermediate to cool growing species from the Eastern Cordillera of the Andes in Western Venezuela and Eastern Colombia that range up to about 11,000 feet. It has four to six flowers typically open simultaneously on a raceme that could be a foot long. The sepals are kind of purple brown with yellow orange tails or, or caudi, uh, making the whole flower up to three inches tip to tip and about an inch wide. Rainfall in this habitat is, is moderate all year with somewhat less in winter and it wants moderate light levels. It's a great photo showing the texture. This is Dave's Cattleya Intermedia Love Knot, clearly an albiform with no evidence of any anthocyanin or, or red pigment. Cat Intermedia is an epiphyte found in Brazil near the Atlantic coast and the upper branches of trees where it receives strong light. And as we can see by Dave's yellow green leaves, he's, he's growing it pretty bright. Um, it also gets strong airflow up there on the treetops, which is important in cultivation as well. Intermedia is one of the most awarded Cattleyas, nearly 200 AOS awards just in the US. And it comes in a beautiful array of color forms from deep rose to this lovely alba. I'm sure we'll see more in coming show and tells. Right, Susan? Uh -huh. And this is Dave's Angraecum germinianum, a species from Madagascar found in the central plateau region. It's cool to cold growing. Attention you outdoor growers in the Bay Area, this one's for you. It's pendant, so it loves to be mounted as Dave shows it here. This is beautifully grown. Applause for Dave. He's had this plant for nine years. The flowers are about three inches and each inflorescence carries a solitary, fragrant, jasmine scented, um, long lasting and, and waxy flower. This is beautiful. This is Tanya Lamb, Cymbidium finlaysonianum. This is one of a small group of cymbidiums which are warm growing tropical plants that like year round warmer temperatures. And because of their pendant inflorescences, which you can see on the right, it's up to four, four to five feet long. This is best grown in a hanging basket. Um, the flowers are fragrant. They're about two inches across. And Finley Sonianum is found in Southeast Asia in lowlands near the sea. And this is a great note. You'll want to, you'll want to write this down. In Borneo, people keep plants of this species in their houses to ward off evil spirits. Also, sprinkling chewed roots of this species over an elephant is thought to cure it. Ooh. Good to know. These are Tanya's Maxillaria tenuifolia, the aurea or golden form on the left and the typical color form on the right. Tenuifolia means with slender leaves. This species is found from Mexico down to Nicaragua at lower elevations from sea level up to about 3000 feet. So that good intermediate growers probably like the same temperature as you do. So this is a rewarding plant for any collection from windowsills to the greenhouse. Most noteworthy is the fragrance described as coconut or copper tone suntan lotion and the aroma will fill the room. After blooming, it likes a semi-dry rest through the winter months. This is Tanya's Vanda tricolor. This is one of my favorite Vandas for the really saturated contrasting colors and the, it's very floriferous. It's a robust plant native to Java where it grows on fairly open tree branches from 2,000 to 5,000 feet of elevation. So it can grow, grow on the cool side of, of intermediate. Unfortunately, a lot of these plants have come from Thailand carrying Cymbidium ring spot virus, CYMV, with absolutely no color break in the flowers, no indication on the leaves. But we heard about this a couple of years ago and um, unfortunately all of the Vanda tricolor plants that Tom Pickford, Susan Anderson and I had in the greenhouse. We had five or six plants from various vendors and sources. They all tested positive for CYMV. This is one of the two viruses that Agnia and Agitest kits test for. So not to be Debbie Downer here, but it's worth testing yours so you don't spread uh, virus to other plants in your collection. 
This is Tanya's on Cidium hostilabium, formerly Odontoglossum hostilabium, native to Peru, Colombia, Venezuela. These are cloud forest orchids found around 5,000 feet. So it's a warm to cool grower with very pleasing stripes and bars patterning the sepals and petals and a big flouncy pink lip. The flower is about three inches. The baker notes indicate that rainfall is much less in the winter, so water should be reduced after the new growths have matured in late autumn. Keeping it too wet will result in the plant weakening and declining. Cake Club shows us three African species purchased from Afri orchids and grown in an intermediate greenhouse. This is Sertorchus Pratermissa, Pratermissa, found in woodlands in Central and South Africa from 1500 to 6100 feet. It's a small plant, as we can see, up to about 10 inches. Lovely arching inflorescences, each with five or six flowers that are about an inch and a quarter. And long, transparent looking spurs or nectaries. The fragrance is said to be like that of Lily of the Valley. This is Kay's Rapidoglossum pulchellum. There are 35 species in the genus Rapidoglossum, I hope I'm saying that right, which has been separated from Diaphananthe because of differences in the flower morphology. This one is a small size, warm to cool growing epiphyte found in the rainforests of Central Africa, Zaire, Rwanda, Kenya, Zambia. And the flowers look like they're made of tissue paper and they are fragrant. And this is Kay's Mysticidium cap capense. We saw Larry and Roy's a few slides ago. This little South African species is certainly charming and Kay has her six inch ruler at the top of the left photo. We can see how tiny this mounted plant is. Kay says it has 50 flowers this blooming. Very nice. And Kay's Bulbophyllum tingaburinum. This is one of the daisy flower like bulbos from Laos, Vietnam, China. Kay says it's a repeat bloomer with these strikingly yellow umbels of flowers on maroon stems. There are over 1,500 bulbophyllum species found in all tropical areas on earth. And the one thing they all have in common is the hinged lip, which we can sort of see on the left-hand photo. It wiggles in the breeze to attract a pollinator to come hither for a good time. Lynn, I want to say something about this one. This is recently, this is actually uh, one that's been on the market for years is Thai Orum, like T-H-A-I, like Thailand. Thai orum, so it's, it has nothing to do with tingabarnum. Tingabarnum is the orange form of pectivenerus, which has a very long, narrow, bright orange um, flowers. This comes in a yellow, orange, reddish, and a bicolored forms. And turns out recently, it's just been fit, figured out to be bubble film tronquetii, T-R-O-N-Q-U-Y-E-T-I-I. -I. So everything that everyone's got in cultivation as Thai orum, from what I understand, is now correctly tronquetii and or Truong Tuetia Tuetia. And, uh, and I guess the uh, Thai worm is not really even on the market. We have not seen it in the United States. I've not seen it in the United States. So. So this is that? This is likely to be, well, it is Truong Tuetia. This okay. is it's completely wrong as Tinker Barnum and it's often sold and usually sold. And most everyone has it as Thai orum, but that's now been realized that it's different, different species. Just can, you write, can you yeah, write so, that in the chat? <laughs> Spell it in the chat. <laughs> um, sure. <laughs> I hope Kay is on and got that. So this is Jan Anderson's Fragmopedium Living Fire. This is a hybrid registered by Orchid Zone in 1995. It's a cross of Sorcerer's Apprentice by Bessie I. Frags mm. like medium light, lots of humidity, so a tray of pebbles filled with water under the pot will do nicely and it should not dry out between waterings. This is also a good window so candidate as it probably likes the same temperatures you do. That pouch is really alluring. This is Jan's Encyclia radiata found from Mexico to Honduras in tropical evergreen forests. The flowers are waxy, they're long lasting, they're very fragrant. And when the lip is uppermost on the flowers like it is here, it's known as non resupinote not, sorry, non resupinant so there you have it. And Jan's Lelia tenebrosa, we saw Dale Martin's tenebrosa earlier, crossed with Lelia pacavia, which we also saw, um, is a Santa Barbara orchids estate registered hybrid called Lelia femme fatale. He registered in 2011. 
And when I look at this resulting hybrid, uh, it's very pretty, but I wonder what the breeder was hoping for because the result looks to me very much like the tenebrosa, which is 75% of the parentage of, of this um, femme fatale. Same great color, same beautiful tubular lip, but with narrower petals. Lelia femme fatale has not been awarded by the AOS. And I'm guessing that's because the offspring is not really an improvement on its parents, which is the goal of in hybridizing. Still lovely, Jan, and you're growing it very nicely. And this is Jan's BLC or Brasso Catlianthi, Empress Worsley, two delightfully large and full flowers with all the ruffles, spots, and stripes you could ever hope for. This is a complex hybrid. The flowers are about three inches and it's just a gorgeous color. And from our president, Jeff Harris, this is Thunia gatsonensis, which is actually a primary hybrid as shown at right. I think it also was a, a naturally occurring um, hybrid in the wild. What's that called? Lost it. Hybrid. Sorry? A natural hybrid. <laughs> natural hybrid. Jeff got this as a raffle table plant from Asbel's orchids at Orchids in the Park 2018. He grows it on the floor of his greenhouse. The canes look a lot like a dendrobium. This goes dormant or it deciduates uh, for a lot of the year, but in late spring, it puts out leaves and it has one to five flowers, flower buds per cane. The flowers are about three inches. They only last a few days, but the fringed yellow throat with red and fuchsia stripes and that long yolky yellow bristles, they're very eye-catching. Probably Lynn, also good pollinator catchers. Lynn, interesting thing about the propagation is you can take the bear canes, lay them horizontally on a bed of moss and each node will sprout a baby, should sprout a baby plant. Huh, and then what do you do? Your canes off, you just lay them horizontally on a bed of moss and they'll sprout at most nodes huh. and root. And then do you take them off? Yeah, and then you, you just them. plant the whole thing. You, just, well, you lay the cane down and you separate the babies. That's very cool, thank you. Because you can see they don't get many bulbs at a time. Huh. Yeah, yeah. Girls, wake up, I'm sorry. This is Jeff's Tendrobium or Dacrylia vasellii. This is an interesting epiphytic species from Northeastern Australia. It has almost terete pencil-like leaves with, there's a deep furrow down the center. It's almost like a succulent. This is best grown mounted as Jeff shows us here. Uh, he has it mounted on cork because the rhizomes creep around the mount from every direction. Uh, it won't stay in a pot. He got this plant from Brookside at POE in 2018. It blooms June or July every year with a spiral of dozens of white, intricate, unusually shaped one inch flowers for inflorescence. And this, this is a good photo to capture them. And Jeff's Rodrumia harvest moon. Rodrumia is a hybrid genus of Tolumnia. Jeff says this is a recent acquisition from Dave Hermeyer. And he loves the canary red flowers with the blood red spotting on them. And they, it, they are emerging from a mounted clump of reddish brown leaves. These uh, little Tolumnia um, miniatures are delight in any, any collection. You have, you have room for them. This is Susan Anderson's Aria hyacinthoides. There are 370 species in this very genus of seldom cultivated orchids. And this one is from Borneo and the Malaysian Peninsula. And oides means it is hyacinth-like. Susan's is a huge plant. It's in, I, I think, about an eight inch pot. And there are inflorescences all the way around 360 degrees. It's really a spectacular showing, disturbing the applause meter tonight. Susan grows this in her intermediate greenhouse with filtered bright light. The flowers are very fragrant. And hopefully, this plant is going to Lincoln for judging this coming Sunday. Mm. So Lynn, I have to say something real quickly. Everyone's, uh, so Eria is um, actually a much reduced genus now. There's- is it Bryobium? Eria is a very small, it's much smaller genus now. There's many genera segregated. I believe this is a- uh, Bryobium? A bryobium, yes. Yeah. So the Bryobium, Panalia, um, there's a lot of new genera and it's actually sticking. It seems like everyone in, in the old world, basically, us, Australian such, they all firmly believe that these genera are separate, unlike a lot of things we see over here where they put them all together. This has actually been accepted. So, so this should be bryobium, by yeah. bryobium hyacinthoides? Bryobium, yeah. yeah. Got it. Thank you. And this is Susan's epidendrum parkinsonianum. This is an epiphyte from Southern Mexico through Central America, Panama. 
is obviously a large pendant plant with flowers that are about six inches wide and about six inches high. The flowers are showy, they're waxy, they're fragrant, and they're long lasting. So this is a great plant. Susan grows it in the intermediate greenhouse with temperatures down to 58 degrees, but Tom Pickford also grows it in his cool greenhouse down to 42 degrees. So it's obviously adaptable. It likes bright light. I believe Susan bought this plant from Jim Rose of Cal Orchid in Santa Barbara. And Susan's Dendrobium demonianum. This is a species from the Himalayan region with long pendant canes and inflorescences that arise from, the inflorescences arise from nearly every node of year old canes, but each node blooms only once. The leaves are deciduous, dropping off before blooming. The flowers last about two weeks and they're about two and a half to three inches. They have a row of hairs along the margins. Ron, we know you like fringe. This one's for you. Yep. Serious fringy lip. I think those yellow orange blotches in the lip, they look like huge dimples to me. This flower always makes me smile. It can take temperatures into the mid thirties and bright indirect light. And Susan's Dendrobium Cuthbertsonii Gold Country. This is a cool to cold growing miniature from New Guinea where plants grow at high elevations on moss covered trees, mossy rocks near streams. This, one, this plant came from Alan Koch of Gold Country Orchids. But as Jeff mentioned earlier, Tom Perliti of Golden Gate Orchids, he has, he has more awards on Cuthbert Sonii than anyone. And the June issue of Orchids Magazine has an excellent article by Tom Perliti uh, with all you ever need to know about how to, blow, how to grow this little beauty successfully. The bottom line, pure water. It's a really rewarding little plant that grows well potted or mounted and the flowers can last for six months or more. Oh. This is my Dikea glauca, glauca meaning gray green, which refers to the leaves, not the flowers. This is an easy to grow epiphytic species found from Mexico to Panama. The plant's about two feet tall, so it's not necessarily a windowsill plant. The many flowers are about a half an inch with uh, one inflorescence arriving, arising from each leaf axle on the upper leaves of, of each cane. I grow this in an intermediate greenhouse with night temperatures down to about 58. It gets moderately bright light, not direct light. Good air movement from the fans 24 seven. And I purchased this from California orchids about three years ago. Stereochylus is a small genus of seven species found in India, Southeast Asia. And Hurtus is the, the hairy Stereochylus referring to the fuzzy little bud you see between the two open flowers and the fuzzy lip margin. Um, it's from the Himalayas, found at elevations up to about 2,500 feet. So I've, I've been growing it in the cool greenhouse, but I think I probably need to uh, move it to the warmer greenhouse for the winter for a little dry rest. I purchased this bare root from Wenching Perner, who was our speaker earlier this year, and I have it mounted on a small cork slab. Nice. And my Bulbophyllum grandiflorum, um, I'd like to start doing bubble films. This is this flower is about two inches wide, four inches long. It lasts about three weeks in the greenhouse. This is a species from Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands, where it's found at low elevations in coastal forests, river valleys. So it likes good humidity, intermediate light, year-round water. Bulbos are great windowsill plants, and Andrew, you should try them. There are over 1,500 species and a bazillion hybrids to choose from, and they are fun to grow because they're all unique. And just a little eye candy, my overgrown Lelia purpurata variety carnea, which I've had for seven or eight years. Winnie Wang shows us this stunning Cattleya hybrid, which he bought at POE a few years ago with no name tag. That frilly fringy lip suggests there might be maybe Digbiana in the family tree. Winnie says it blooms every year during this time. The large flower is about five inches wide. She says it has a sweet, delightful fragrance and she has it in a six inch pot. This is Winnie's Dendrobium burana dark blue. It's a Phalaenopsis type Dendrobium hybrid with deep purple blue sepals and petals and a very saturated purple lip. Winnie says it blooms twice a year for her in a five inch pot. The foliage looks nice and clean too. So nice job, Winnie. Winnie also shows us this Phalaenopsis hybrid which has a light fragrance during the day. It has nice clear yellow color with little freckles around the lip. And now we're on to the pet parade. This is Kay's peaches, approaching full Halloween cat mode 
in case this Oncidium decides to attack. <laughs> okay. And the last photo of the evening. <clears throat> we see big progress on Jan Anderson's new greenhouse. Over in the bottom right was when we saw it last month. And next it gets water and electricity, then benches. Bailey is uh, Jan's three and a half year old golden doodle. And you can see he's wondering, how did you get me in here? Why am I in here anyway? He's very cute. Very cute. So thank you all for the photos. And you can see I use some of the Ron and Mary orchid information. Thank you. Great job, Lynn. Ron, thank you for your help. You're welcome. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, we're right on time. Doing great. And Ron, I think uh, I see a lot of your, your guests in the in the room. So are you ready to take over sharing? Sure, no problem. Okay. Um, oh, I guess I should introduce you actually. Can I introduce you first? <laughs> Hold on one second. Let me do this real quick. So for those that don't know Ron, the two or three of you in the room maybe. So Ron is a longtime SFS um, member and very, uh, active in the society. He often uh, ran the show and tell uh, table when we were meeting in person before Lynn took this on for us uh, last year. Um, he is a well-known uh, wildlife uh, flower photographer and, and author of uh, several books. His talk tonight is on uh, rarities and oddities of the orchid world. And I've got the description, which I won't read everything here to you. This was also in the newsletter if you want more info, but just wanted to thank Ron. Always a pleasure and thanks for coming to talk to us. Thank you, Jeff. All right, so let's uh, get this one going, I guess. So, um, So I had this talk on a slide when I would do it when I was doing slides. I had this is, it was my favorite and most called for talk, but this is a completely different talk. They're all um, new slides, new species for the most part. So um, I'm waiting for my little spinning rainbow here to stop spinning so we can enlarge the, the frame here. But I've actually uh, my favorite way of seeing orchids is actually to see them in the wild. So that's, everyone knows I love to take photos. Um, I love seeing things in the wild, but when I don't, I love visiting collections with species. I pretty much just am into species. Um, I've been growing orchids for 40, going on 47 years now, and I've liked species for, the, for almost all of that time. So um, this talk was put together for that love of it. And you'll, you'll, you'll see something interesting. Actually, I noted it, uh, after a couple of times of watching it, that I had this affinity for uh, frilly, fringy, hairy orchids because of, uh, I, I'm just kind of jealous of them because of my lack of hair on my head. So um, you'll notice, you'll note that when you're looking at these. I've grouped these in related uh, sections. Um, the terrestrials, not so much, they just all happen to be terrestrials. But uh, with this, I'm gonna start with this Habenaria medusa. And interestingly for a terrestrial orchid, this species is quite um, easy to grow, evidently. I have not grown it, but I know people have not only grown it, but their plants have enlarged and, and increased in size with more additional bulbs. And they've seen some really spectacular ones in cultivation now. The flowers are about two and a half inches across, almost, almost three inches across. And as you can see, they're very spectacular. The genus itself is widespread across the world in most continents. Even there's in Australia and such, we have them in the Southeast part of the United States. Um, all throughout Mexico and South America, Africa, everywhere actually. So it's an amazing genus. And this is just a single spike of it, but you can see how spectacular they really are. Uh, closely related genus and one that used to be considered part of the Habanary genus is Platanthera. And this is a, um, as far as I know, it's a, a Northern hemisphere genus, but there are a lot of species. And for whatever reason, we have some in California and they're like, oh, those are nice. But you go to the east, eastern part of the United States has the most spectacular ones, what are called the fringe orchids. There's three of this orange, there's three species that you would call orange fringe orchids. And this is the rarest of the three. They, um, this one occurs from the 
a little bit of the panhandle of Florida and very few areas all the way over to the very southeastern part of Texas. And it is rare no matter where it is from. I've seen it many times in the Apalachicola National Forest in, in the panhandle of Florida. And I would see a couple hundred at a time. And they bloom in like the hottest part of the year, it seems mid-August or about August 10th or so. And uh, Mary and I went there in August of 2019. And for whatever reason, there was about 2,000 of them, literally. They were just all lining these roads. So it was pretty spectacular. This one is Platanther chetmanii. Not a very common orchid. That's actually used to be common in cultivation. It's just actually kind of maybe difficult to keep alive. It's a cold, hardy species of pectilis, another habanary segregate. It's called the egret orchid for obvious reasons. A species from, um, um, I believe, China and Japan, I think also Korea. And it needs a very cold dormancy. So keep that in mind if you try to get this. These used to be quite common, but you don't see them very much anymore. This is something that uh, Mary and I got to see when we went to China with Wenqing in Sichuan province. Sichuan province being the uh, province to the east of Tibet. And uh, we were up pretty high. We were looking for rare superpidiums, which you'll see um, a couple later. And this is a species, actually it's now considered a hemipelia. Um, but at the time, Holger, Holger Perner did not know what it was when he showed this to us. He, to him, it was a new species. It turned out it had been named quite a long time ago, but what a really delicate little beautiful thing. We were, everyone was taken with it. And there was a number of them, which was, was fun. There's darker ones and lighter ones. So um, interesting, this genus is, uh, it's actually got about 37 species. It's from tropical Africa. This one at least is from tropical Africa across the west to the east. Um, this is Marnie Turkel's plant of it. And uh, flowers are about, probably going not two inches, maybe an inch and a half, but they have this wonderful, interestingly uh, grape grape soda smell to a very perfumey flowers. And Marnie's done very well with it. It's increased in size over the years. I think she lost the main plant, but has, has since uh, she, she um, pollinated and has now seedlings and or other plants of it now. So this is Brachycorathus calbrayeri. I love the little jewel orchids because of the beautiful foliage. I think everyone does. Um, some of them can be kind of difficult to keep alive, but Anecticalis to me is the favorite of them all. It has the beautiful foliage that's veined red or golden on generally a dark green, nearly blackish leaf, a um, little rosette of leaves. They grow on the forest floors of Asia. Interestingly, one of the three actual native orchids of Hawaii is Anecticalis. This one is from Taiwan, Anecticalis formosanus. It's, I won't say it's readily available. It was for a period of time, but I think it's still around, but I don't, it's not as common as it once was. Nothing beautiful about this, but the interesting thing about the name is this is this, the botanist who named this genus uh, called it Aa, so it would be the first plant genus of the entire plant kingdom. So uh, uh, is the very first genus that will come up in a listing of genera. So this is a species from high elevation. I don't know which one it is. The, the genus is high elevation in the Andes. This one was in uh, about 10,000 plus feet in Ecuador. Maybe actually might have been like 13,000 feet. And what you see in the center, the little orchids with the holes in the center, those are the open flowers. So below that, they start to form seed pods and above it, they're still buds. So it's what we call a sequential flowering inflorescence. Um, I love uh, the little bee orchids in, in, um, in Europe. I went specifically in Europe in 2008 to see, the, to see as many terrestrial orchids as I could, and this includes the bee orchids. Interestingly, on the very first trip was to Crete, the largest Greek island, and we saw probably 15 or so species of ophrys. Ophrys being the famous bee orchids, and for whatever reason, this one is called the mirror orchid. It's, not, it's a bee orchid, but they call it the mirror orchid. Obviously, speculum means mirror. It has this really rich blue labellum, and it's fringed in a little fur coat. It's really cute. I photographed this one on the island of Mallorca. It belongs part of the Balearic Islands of Spain. One of my favorites though is this one we saw in Crete. This is an endemic to Crete, obviously Ophrys cretica. Um, the flowers in this were probably about an inch and a half, so they're quite small, but uh, incredibly beautiful. I just, I'm really taken with them. This one is, for whatever reason, is not called a bee orchid. They call this the sawfly orchid, but it is a member of the bee orchid genus. This is Ophrys tenthridanifera. And I've been to, uh, now I've been to many or several countries in the Mediterranean region. And I've seen it everywhere from Mallorca in the wet, in, in the west to uh, Cyprus in the east. Cyprus being about 40 miles off the Israeli coast and Syrian coast. So interesting, but this one is, uh, 
It's a lovely thing. And a lot of these species come in green forms as well as pink forms pink flowered forms. They're not albas. They have the same colors on the coloration on the lip. It's just that they come in, a lot of the pink species come in a green coloration, color form also. Mary and I got to see this when we went to uh, Sulawesi, being one of the largest islands in the world, a part of Indonesia. And Corbus, there's a number of them in Australia and New Zealand. And I always wanted to see them when I went to Australia. They actually bloom really late winter and early spring, a lot of the species. So I've, I've only seen a handful of them. But this one is a beautiful one because of the lovely foliage, the one leaf, the singular leaf. Um, it's called picta, which means painted. And as you can see, it has these long, um, I guess they're petal, not all petals. There's two petals, I suppose. I don't really know the flower parts of this particular one, but the genes are considered, are called helmet orchids. And they're actually not that easy to cultivate. And this, this species was on the market for a brief period of time with JNL orchids, but I don't know anyone who's been able to keep these alive. One of my favorite orchids in Australia is this one. It's called the lizard orchid, Bernedia cuneata. And it's a monotypic genus. The only one in its genus, it's fire dependent. They will only bloom after a fire. And as you can see, there's no leaves, no chlorophyll. Um, interestingly, um, the second year after a fire, you might get a couple. And then by the third year, you won't see them until there's been another burn. So uh, it's, it's only found in, it's found in Tasmania, I think Victoria. I don't think it goes. I think it's the only two states of Australia it comes in. Another fire orchid. This is named literally means fire orchid. Pyrorch is like pyromania. Pyrorch is nigricans. It's an interesting in, in, this, in the way with Australian orchids. And that's one of the handful of species of terrestrial species that's found both in the Southeast and the Southwest. Um, there's very few species that cross the continent and are, and are the same on both sides. This one occurs, as I said, both sides. There's only two species. The other species is only found in the southwest. So um, Pyrorchis has a, a large resting leaf when it's not blooming. The leaves can be, I've seen them about 10 inches across, but when it flowers, it just has a, a one to two inch leaf when it, when it flowers. It could have up to about, I've only seen them up with four flowers at a time. But again, they only flower after a fire. It's fire dependent. I love the sun orchids in Australia. Unfortunately, uh, during the springtime, there's a lot of overcast days. So you might be in an area where they are, but unless it's warm and sunny, they struggle to open. Um, there's a number of blue species. This is one that I've found in, in, with Jim Coots in, um, I think he's online here today, tonight. Um, found this in uh, Southwest Australia down in, um, um, at a national park that um, Andrew Brown, the expert on Southwest orchids, uh, told us about, actually we met him there, so it was great. <clears throat> uh, one of my favorite genera of all, and, and, and one that you don't see in cultivation, I don't know anyone who grows it, are the beard orchids, Calicylus. So Calicylus, there's a, I, I think the numbers increase, but there's probably about a dozen species. This one is found in Tasmania, in Victoria, and I think maybe even into New South, New South Wales. I like, the, I like it obviously for obvious reasons. It's got this big beard to it, but I like the little eyes you got on there and the little green nose. I think it's just a real charming thing. Um, Jim has done a lot of things for me um, and taken me a, a lot of places to see orchids, but nothing like this. This is a species that occurs on what's called the central coast of Australia. It's a very limited range species, just a matter of acres. And uh, Jim has a friend, and he's a friend of mine too, Alan Stevenson, who actually, um, protects and, and, um, and does a lot of work on endangered species in that region of which is several species. And he's actually gone to battle for them. He's had a lot of, uh, a lot of struggles trying to keep these things protected and this one being that. So I had, before we went there to visit um, Alan, I didn't even know about this particular species. It was quite amazing when I saw it, I was blown away. Um, so Gastrodia is an interesting genus. I don't know if you guys saw that uh, article about I'm guessing about a half a year ago, the world's ugliest orchid. That was a species, I think, from the Himalayas, maybe India. Anyway, it's, it was a species of Gastrodia. The, the three orchids, the three Gastrodias in Australia are called potato orchids for whatever reason, maybe because of the shape of the, the buds or such. Um, this is the largest of the three, I believe. Stems can be about two feet tall. Uh, flowers are um, maybe about an inch. I don't think they're all that big. And um, they only bloom, no chlorophyll, no, no leaves, anything. So there's um, a saprophyte, a saprophytic orchid. So um, took a long time to see these because they bloom a little bit later than I usually go to Australia. They bloom in very late, uh, very late spring. 
into November, and even, I guess, December. One of the two species of enamel orchids, this is a species from the southwest part of, the genus is uh, endemic to the southwest part of Australia. And they're called enamel orchids because they're so shiny. No matter how you photograph them, you get this reflection, the sheen to the flowers. This one is emarginata. The other species has deep purple flowers, brunonis. I like this species very much. This is a the flying duck orchid for obvious reasons. It's a, it, it looks like a duck in flight. Interesting orchid um, uh, anatomy thing here. So the lowest segment you see is the dorsal sepal. The two little thread-like things, those are the um, petals. The wings are the lateral sepals and the head is the lip. And then the what looks to be the duck's breast, those are actually wings off of the column. Um, most of the, Australian terrestrial, or many of the Australian terrestrials are pollinated by thinnied wasps, a group of wasps. The males tend to um, find these orchids overwhelmingly attractive. They try to, they try to pick up the, they think they're picking up a female wasp to mate with it. And instead they actually are lured to the flowers. And in doing so, they, they what they normally do to a female wasp is pick her up and carry her away. But with orchids, they land on a lip and the lip snaps shut and then throws the wasp into the into the column with the pollen. And it, get, it does it a couple of times, one to pick up the pollen, and one to affect pollination, but it, it only works a couple of times. Then they're like, I guess even wasps can learn. One of the beautiful donkey orchids, a very complex structure. I'm actually, I still am confused as to what is what on there. I believe the two ears on this donkey orchid is are the uh, are the petals. I, I actually, I have to study this a little bit better because I've seen lots of diurus, but I can't keep it straight. Interestingly, they mimic these pea, flower, pea family flowers in Western Australia. They're found in both halves of the country, but this is, this is a Western Australian species. But a lot of them mimic uh, pea family bushes. There's a, a huge number of pea family plants in Australia. And it's said that these mimic those to be pollinated. Another one of those weird stories like the flying duck orchid, this is a hammer orchid. So interestingly, the uh, same kind of arrangement, the dorsal sepals way over to the right, the column, the petals and lateral sepals are the little threads hanging down and the rest of it is all the labellum. And you can see the lip is hinged right in the middle. And that same thing, the wasp tries to carry away the female wasp and it throws it, it just is on a pivot and it throws them right up to get right against the column picking up the pollen and again one more time to affect pollination with another flower. Beautiful spider caladenias. The genus caladenia was split up for a while then they all went back to caladenia. There's several groups, there's a two or three groups of spider caladenias and there are these smaller ones called lady fingers and pink ladies and, and such. But this is one of the spider caladenias and interestingly it was found on a major road in Western Australia. It was just on the side of the road when they found the colony. It turned out it was a new species um, this one is Caldini Procera. You can quickly, interestingly, see on the dorsal sepal as well as the lateral sepals, you can see that the halfway of the, or almost half of that is thickened. And that's because it has osmophores, as it releases fragrances that only the insects can detect, the male wasps. So they're attracted to the look of the flower, the shape of the lip, the osmophores releasing the fragrances. So it's a very complex pollination strategy that orchids have, Many, most orchids have. They're the most highly uh, evolved plants in the world. Another beautiful spider caladenia. This is in the, on the um, west coast. It's a stone's throw from the ocean. As a matter of fact, I was photographing these and I stood up and there's a whole, I don't know what you call a, a bunch of kangaroos, but they were giant kangaroos. They're actually kind of scary looking when they stand up and looking looking like they, they want to kick your butt. So anyway, you can see the uh, osmophores on these also you can see that the, they're thickened and they're darker than the rest of the flower. I like these, Jim was with me when I, we found that, well, Jim was with me with all these last ones. This is a uh, one of the green, or, green hood orchids. As you know, we grow several species in the Bay Area and I know, I know they're down in Southern California too, uh, but this is a part of a group that is not easily cultivated. And um, I don't think any, I've seen them ever, I've never seen them outside of Australia. When we found this one, it was, it was, uh, unnamed species, but we now think it's uh, Terrastalis turfosa. And unlike the ones we grow in cultivation, this one has about a three inch flower. And that thing that looks like a fish bone, that's actually the lip on, on the flower and the petals and the lip are in, I'm sorry, the petals and the column are inside that translucent hood. So it's a very, again, very complex arrangement of anatomy to this flower. 
So this is so that little terrestrial market I showed you earlier that I said Wenching and Holger showed us that was at the same site. This is a this is kind of a sad story in the sense of we went there to see a very rare cypripedium and interestingly and sadly uh, Holger said do not post any pictures of the area of the situation of the habitat because they you, there'll be mountains that have you know obviously mountains are going to be a certain look to them. He said that people will go online recognize these areas, go to these areas, dig up these plants, and then sell them on the black market. So it's really critical. He, was thought, he, he felt it was very critical that no one posts pictures of it. And it was an extremely beautiful area. So interestingly, Tibeticum, which is quite widespread, this was relatively common many places we went in, in um, Sichuan. So this was, uh, in its own right, it's beautiful. It's a big, bold, three-inch flower on about a a six inch plant or a lot of them are very small. So everyone loved this one. And then we went to, um, so what we wanted to see, what he showed us was this species, which reminds me of uh, Paphia petalum, the hybrid called Doll Goldie. So it's interesting that, and this is extremely rare. This is the one he was very concerned about because there's a limited number of individuals. And so this is what he didn't want anybody to know where these were. So interestingly, Mary and I are there and we, ever, we, you know, we kind of do our own things when we're out in the wild and we try to call to each other when, when something, when we find something. But we've all been walking around a bit and we get down to the bus. I guess maybe you just went down to the bus for lunch. But you can imagine you're at very high elevation. You're, you, you know, you don't really want to walk around if you don't have to because you're out of breath. So Mary's, well, she goes, well, what do you think of this? And I was like, flip. I said, where did you see that? She goes, oh, I saw it up on the hill. We, she could have said something when we were up there, but she didn't. And Fortunately, she showed me the bus because this is the rare natural hybrid between the last two species you saw. Holger named this after his wife, Wen Ching. So this is a natural hybrid of the red one you saw and the yellow one you just saw. So interesting, I'll go back for a second. See the top of the pouch, it's got these little teeth on it. That's very characteristic. And uh, Tibeticum does not. So that by that, you can see it's got the color of Tibeticum, but it's got the toothed margin to the pouch. So anyway, I flipped, but fortunately I got to see it. So. Mary redeemed, redeemed herself, and that was a good thing. So <laughs> um, I went to Ecuador in right before COVID hit in uh, December of 2019, and we went out with Herberto Marino, uh, who comes to the shows and sells, and uh, I'd always wanted to see a Selenopedium. There are five genera of lady slipper orchids, obviously Paphia petalins from tropical Asia, frags from Central and tropical America, uh, Mexopedium from Mexico, uh, Cypripedium from the Northern Hemisphere of the world and Selenopedium from the New World. And it grows, interestingly, it grows like kind of like a bamboo, a soft leaf bamboo. And the flowers bloom on a sequential flowering inflorescence and they only last one day. So we were looking, we saw one was kind of chewed up, went, oh man. And then, and then um, uh, Hilberto went up into the bushes and found one in full bloom. So this is actually interesting. It's a new species described fairly recently called Selenopedium dodsonii. Of course, this is a stunner. I waited years to see these now. Um, I've seen a number of them and it's just a spectacular species. Everyone knows the story of Kovacii, Fragmopedium Kovacii, so I won't go into it, but literally the flowers, excuse me, are about eight inches in, in diameter. So it's a spectacular find. Um, I got to see this at a collection locally. I'm very surprised at it because the only other plant I've seen it, it's native to Sulawesi, it's endemic to Sulawesi. And we, Mary and I saw uh, one in a collection of somebody who took us around for a couple of days there. And he had a plant, literally the plant was probably about almost a meter across. It's a huge plant. And this individual locally had two plants of this. So that was pretty cool. I got to see them. And they have this characteristic twist to the petals. So it's a very interesting species, obviously related to Rothschild Andam and such. This is another one. The same individual had this plant. This actually should not be in the United States. It's probably an illegal um, uh, importation. Rung Suriana was found a number of years ago, but fairly recently. It's only from Lao, the country of Lao. People say Laos, but I believe it's pronounced Lao. And it's a wonderful thing. The flower is only about two and a half inches tall. You can see the plant. It's plant, the flower is as big as the plant. It actually, the plant does get bigger, but it was a real treasure to get, a real find to be able to get to see and photograph this plant, because I don't think we're ever going to see it. I think it's probably going to be extinct in a while before it becomes on the market. I've not seen anyone offer it. I've only seen this one plant, and I don't believe this plant is even alive anymore. Um, so, so now we're into the uh, monopodials. Um, so that means things like angricoids and dendaceous orchids, where they grow from a central point. So this is something that um, 
it used to be called teratofolium. There is a species called teratofolium. It's this one is correctly linear folium. It's a beautiful thing. This is K. clums plant. I think it's a very striking feature. As you know, this long nectary, the spur on the flowers is uh, each species of agricoids, whether it includes orangus, uh, angricum, jumelia, and any of the numerous other genera are pollinated by night flying moths. As we all know the story about the angricum sesquipedale. And the, and the moth that was found after Darwin died. Anyway, wonderful group of orchids, night fragrant usually, um, but everyone loves them. Some are difficult to keep alive. Um, this one's not the easiest one. This is one that belonged to Cindy Hill. Um, she sold it when her collection got sold. This is a plant that she bought as Angricum urshianum, which is a beautiful little plant and actually same size, very similar plant form, except that plant Urshianum has these silver mar silvery markings on the plant, which this one did not. It lacked this, and she bought it as a Angricum brevi, which it is not. But a wonderful little thing. That plant's probably two, two and a half inches across. You can see how large those flowers are proportioned to the plant. Um, Cindy also had Aerosanthe henriquia. Aerosanthe is a segregate out of Aranthes, the only one in its genus. It's one of the rarest orchids. It's The flowers can be these flowers are probably five inches across. Um, I think Cindy had three or four clones of this species. It's a Madagascar and endemic. Interesting, I believe Aerosanthe is an anagram of Aranthes. I think if you spell it out, I'm pretty sure it's the same number of letters, but that's what I've heard. It's an, an anagram of the genus. It's a segregate and the name is an anagram. Anyway, lovely, lovely species. For, of course, the famous, um, um, ghost orchid from the southern two most counties of Florida, endemic to that county. Um, this is, I think, this is Chris Mendez of, of the Tiny Jungle. This is her plant. She got it awarded. But Judy Carney liked this so much, she got a, uh, she got a tattoo on her arm of this species. So that's pretty cool. Anyway, we get to see that all the time with Judy's arm. But anyway, Dendrophylax lindenii is interesting. It was called Polyriza. There's a nearly identical sister species from Cuba called Sallii. Just as beautiful, just, I don't even know what segregates them actually, but a wonderful group of orchids. And these are new world agricoids. So agricoids are not just tropical Africa and Madagascar. There are a few genera in the new world, Campylus centrum, dendrophylax, um, maybe just two. I love the leafless orchids. I know that uh, several members of our society really like them. I missed the talk where the lady gave, a, uh, I think a lady gave a talk about these or maybe leafless orchids. I think she spoke about leafless orchids and spoke about Kyla Schista. And I know a lot of people try to give them a dry, hard rest. And she said she just gives them less water in the winter, but does not dry them out. So I think people are doing better with these now with that information. This is one that was from China. We think it, it came in as Yunonensis, um, but it is, uh, um, we're not sure what it is. And this genus is extremely confused because uh, all the type specimen, all the type species, the, their descriptions are so vague, you, like you're left to wonder what any of them are. So, and real quickly with the name, Yunnanensis means it's from Yunnan, the province below Sichuan and above North Vietnam. And whenever you see ensis or ensis, E-N-S-I-S or E-N-S-E at the end of a name, it means it's from that area. So it's a good to know that. Um, beautiful thing. This went through a series of uh, name changes. This is from the Indian region. Um, it went from Esmeralda to Arachnanthi to Arachnus now. So this is Arachnus cathcardii. It's one of the few orchids I know of that has this concentric, concentric ring pattern throughout the flower. The flowers are about three inches in diameter with the hinge lip. That lip wiggles no matter which way you move the flower. And a very large plant, not that wide, but can be quite long, about a meter or more long. Not a beautiful phalaenopsis, but actually, I think it's the only one on the endangered species list. This is the Philippine endemic called Michalitsii, and it's related to Violacea and that group of phalaenopsis. So, um, and if you do see it, I would get it. It's got about a two inch flower. So um, it's just, it's not as patterned or boldly marked as a lot of the other species it's related to. This is a rare thing. This is a, so interestingly, um, there was this gentleman, I only met him at Scott Dallas's of White Oak Orchids a number of, several years ago, actually. And Scott had gotten an order or a shipment of Vanda Javieri, a Philippine species, very similar to this, but uh, different. And this Carson Barnes, some of you may know him, I only had just met him, thought there's something different about this. And he sent it in for, um, whatever people send orchids in for and he got it named for him. So it's Vanda Barnesii. I know Jim Coots knew about it 
uh, back when, but people were thinking it was just a form of, of um, Javieri. So anyway, both are very beautiful. Both are coolish growing Philippines uh, banded species. This is got a, this is lineages. I'm not sure what these are very, are that closely related to, but this is a beautiful thing belonging to Cindy Hill. Um, she sold this, sold this in her collection, but this is Appendicula malingdongensis, and I believe it's a Philippine species. This one is just stunning. It's a very large plant. The plants are a meter tall. They kind of look like a, a, a dendrobium of sorts, um, but they're actually not related at all. I, I don't really know the, uh, I think it's the Podocylia, uh group of orchids. Anyway, it's stunningly colorful. Correct. Um, this is Mary's plant of Oberonia satigera. Satigera means bristle bearing. And as you can see, the bract above each flower is this long, narrow thing that sticks out. It's a beautiful thing. The genus is completely, uh, um, uh, it's very complex. It's very hard to identify plants. They're highly confused. Um, but I know Daniel Geiger uh, has written a, is very interested in this genus. And um, I, I can see why. There's, he, needed a, he, he actually has done electron microscope photos of them to, se to separate them out and identify them. This is Mary's plant of the flowers. Each one of those little dots on it is the column, the column cap, so pollen cap. So you can see how small those individual flowers are growing in whorls. And then this is the plant uh, that that was taken from. So a beautiful thing. Um, Catacetums, they're one of the, it's a new world genus. They're from tropical um, uh, Central and South America. There's a huge number from Brazil that have been found that are just stunning. This is one of those uh, genera of orchids of closely knit allied species that have male and female flowers. The plants are not male or female, the flowers are. And some plants can have male and female spikes on the same plant at the same time. And there's occasionally, um, there's herma hermaphroditic flowers of both sexes. But these, the male flowers are typically very beautiful. The females are um, very similar in that they have this hood to them. A lot of them look very similar and almost unidentifiable, but the male flowers easily differentiate the species. This is a fairly new species, relatively new species from Brazil called Denticulatum. Mermodes is another one. It's not, they're not sexually, they're not uh, male and female flowers. They're, they're, um, but they have, uh, they're in the same alliance. They're in the Catacetonae. And this is, they're commonly called, we don't call them that, but a long time ago they were in books as the goblin orchids. But one interesting thing about this is that they're asymmetrical. So you can see that the petals and sepals and the lip and the column all kind of twist to one side. So that's pretty, that's one of the few unique genera in the, in the orchid family that have, um, have asymmetrical flowers. There's some new world, I'm sorry, old world genera that uh, also are asymmetric. For a long time, this was thought to be, Galandras were thought to be part of the same alliance as Cymbidiums, but they've been determined to be part of the Catacetonae. This is an unidentified species. I love the cat, I love the Galandras. I used to try and, and have as many as I could when I grew warm under lights, um, but I, I don't have that anymore. But regardless, this is an unidentified species belonging to Marnie Turkel. And uh, I think she struggled to keep them alive. I think some of them are quite difficult, but you can see they're beautiful. Almost the entire flower is the lip, the labellum. Uh, cymbidium, cymbidiums, um, not a beautiful one. It's in the subgenus Gensoa. Interesting though, this has no leaves and no chlorophyll. It comes out of the ground like those saprophytic terrestrials I showed you. Actually, it's terrestrial, but it's a cymbidium. And there's this species in defoliatum, and there may be one or two others, macrorhizon, I think, that they just have no chlorophyll. They just, the inflorescence has come out of the ground. So Holger Perner had this at his collection in his greenhouse or in his last house in Sichuan. I've seen, it, I've seen it here in the States. I had one for a short period of time. I think a lot of people did through Buddy Fun Mark, but unfortunately no one was able to keep them alive long-term. Beautiful thing, the Lelianae. Epidendrum is the largest genus of the Lelianae. There's 1,500 plus species found from Florida all the way through Central America, the, the Caribbean, South America. Um, it's a highly confused taxonomic group but they're wonderful. Um, they, as I, I should have said, the, this group, the Layla and I all have terminal inflorescences except for very few, infor, every, very few uh, ex, um, exceptions like the, um, the little red guy we saw earlier. <laughs> anyway, Epidendrum illensi was discovered in Ecuador and they went back to go find more after it was discovered, after it was described and the whole area had been deforested. Evidently it's been found in a little few other individuals, but probably not enough to keep the species alive in the wild. 
What is pretty cool about it is if you can get this plant, it blooms again and again and again. As you can see, the inflorescence starts branching. So you have many separate little inflorescences there. As you look at the top, it's a branched inflorescence. Epidendum illensi. Each of those flowers is about two inches long with a beautiful white parachute of a lip, fringe parachute. Beautiful thing, not that rare, but really beautiful, very amazing. Epidendum medusa is a favorite of many people. A lot of people struggle to keep this alive. It wants cool conditions and not that cool. It probably would do best down to about 50 or so. Uh, likes high quality water as an attractive gray green plant. Um, flowers can be three inches in length. So it really is a stunning plant, really beautiful all, all overall. Nothing rare, but incredibly beautiful. And again, it's the fringes I love. It's Wrinkle Lily Digbiana. This is the species that has imparted its fringed lips to many of the Cattleya hybrids we see. So these SLCs, uh, BC, BC being Bras Brasso Cattleyas, but I now think uh, they've changed. Uh, Lynn can correct me, but I think uh, Wrinkle Lily, I think somehow that's um, imparted into the hybrid, the, the, the new the new generic names when it evolves these, these species. Anyway, four inch flowers, five inch flowers, incredible citrus smell, fragrant. And I mean, look at that. If we didn't see this all the time, you would think that was pretty amazing. And it is, you have to just, it's one of those things where familiarity breeds contempt. So don't let it. Uh, Steve Beckerdorf was instrumental in, in rediscovering the species in the Santa Marta region of Venezuela. It's got four inch flowers. It's a beautiful thing. It was lost for many, many, many years. That part of Colombia, the Santa, Santa Marta area, that's the highest coastal mountains in the world. They go from the coast straight up and it's a, it's a cloud forest species. And actually I have a piece of, uh, of this original plant, not the original plant, but one of the newer, uh, plants that came out of the species. So I feel pretty lucky to have that. So Oncidium or Odonoglossum nevium. I'm not getting in the middle of that one. So you got Odonoglossum growers and they'll kill you if you say they're Oncidium. So Tolumnia, we saw that one that I think Jeff had, that was a Rodrus, Rodra, Rod, Rodrumia. Rod, anyway, it's a hybrid between Rodrigesia and Tolumnia. This Tolumnia is interesting because it's the largest species that occurs on Hispaniola, the island of Dominican Republic in Haiti. It occurs at elevations. It likes cool conditions and collections. It's quite a rare species. Um, the plants evidently in the wild, their leaves can get a foot long. So that it's quite a large Tolumnia. Anyway, it's a beautiful thing. If you can get it, treasure it. I love Tilopogons. For years, they were in a section called the Tilopogoni. Um, now they've been determined to be part of the Oncidium. So they're in the Oncidiumi. There's about 110 or more species. Excuse me, they put the they submerge the genus Stelilabium, which is little tiny flowers into this genus. So the genus has been enlarged. I think actually there's more like 160 species now. Um, Ernie Cattler, who's here tonight or was, um, he had this species. This is not his plant, but uh, he used to grow this species. I love him for the lines, the checkers, the, the everything about him is just wonderful. But interestingly, the flower in the center looks like a, a tachnid wasp, a tachnid fly, I'm sorry. And the, and the male flies try to there's two theories. One, they, th they see a female, they try to mate with it, but I've also heard the theory that the male fly sees another uh, a combatant, a, 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 a opponent, and tries to fight with it. Either way, the flower becomes, affects the pollination. So it's pretty amazing. Dendrobium is a large genus, again, one of the largest in the world, about 1,800 species. This is Cindy Hill's plant of Dendrobium arantiflamium. Flowers about three inches long. It's from Borneo. It's highly expensive if you, if you can find it for sale. They're hard to establish, but of course, City does an amazing job with their plants. And this is one that you just don't see very often. It's a wonderful thing. Um, it grows in this soft, kind of like a kind of a thin, slender bamboo-like plant, bamboo-ish like plant. You know, it's a lovely thing. The inflorescence are very lax. As you can see, the flowers are non-resupinate. Um, it's just, it's wonderful. Glows orange. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, this is a plant that I wanted for years to see. This is Dendrobium brimerianum. And as you can see, the fringes got fringes and that's why I love it. And I, I waited for years to see it. And then Cindy Hill brought one to the San Francisco meeting one time. And not only was it like a plant, it was a specimen. And each of the flowers were much larger than I even knew they would be. I thought they'd be like one inch flowers. It was about two and a half inch flowers. Just incredibly beautiful. If you like the species and you go looking for it, make sure you find one in bloom though, because this species has a tendency to be autogamous or cleistagamous, self-pollinating. So you actually want to find one that you know has open flowers. But anyway, it's from Thailand or from that, that Southeast Asian 
part of the of Asia. Another one, this is very closely related to the Rantaflamin we saw a minute ago, the Dermacinaburinum. I should have said that one is from Borneo. This is also from Borneo. Some of the flowers, some of the clones have very round flowers. They're thought to mimic varia rhododendrons. Anyway, very lax inflorescences. You actually have to hold the spike up to photograph it, but these are about three inch flowers. So it's a, it's a real stunner. Of course, we talked about Cuthbert Sonii early. This is John Leather's plant of, um, one, it's a clone, I forgot the clonal name, but it's one that was collected by Dick Emery many years ago, like decades ago in New Guinea. And if you don't know Dick Emery, he was a member for a very long time. He's actually Francis LaRose's uncle. So anyway, um, this is his, this is from him originally. This is John Leather's plant. And one that came on the market a number of years ago, Didriba Huckoense, not that long ago, is this little cute um, um, Chinese endemic. The plants get to maybe two inches. The flowers are about an inch. They last for weeks. They come in a, a kind of a nearly creamish greenish color to this, these really uh, ones with very nice uh, uh, reddish wine colored suffusion. So it's a wonderful species. I know Andy grows them outside in his last house. I grow mine under lights. Um, I know Cindy had five different clones. This is one of her clones here. Anyway, I highly recommend this species, but unfortunately it's from a very small area of China. And in, in such, it's probably gonna be um, extirpated in the wild just because that's how things happen. When you find a desirable species, things get over collected. Uh, something that Cindy had that no one has seen before or since, she sold her plants. And I know my friend bought both of her plants. It's a beautiful species, it's New Guinean. Flowers last a long time. She had beautiful plants of them, but they only flowered a couple of times, but the, they made the cover of the Orchid Digest. This is called Dendrobium vanuisii. And look at the lip. It's got this little closed lip. It's thought to be pollinated by sunbirds because no fragrance, just the bright colors. So anyway, very, very, very rare species. I don't think you're gonna be likely to see this one ever, or rarely in bloom. I mean, I, I haven't seen it before or since. Um, the Stanopia and I, there's uh, about 60, I think there's about 40 something species of Stanopia. This one is called Hernandezii from Mexico. It's related to Tigrina. So it's one of the two flowered, maybe three flowered uh, species. This is one is was known by, I think it was the Mayans who had um, hieroglyphics of this in their writing. They actually knew this and it has a, has a, uh, has a uh, it's either Mayan or Aztecan uh, uh, name for it too. Oh, sorry. Beautiful one from Brazil. So very variable in coloration. The species is uh, is incredibly variable. But real real quickly with Stenopia, the configuration of the lip, the hypochile is the the big bulgy thing. The two horns are the mesochile, and the bottom part, the little spade shaped or heart shaped thing, that's the epichile. So it's a very complex lip. The bee slips in. He tries to collect wax to attract a mate. It's one of those little bright blue and green euglossine bees. Anyway, they as they slide, they slide down, they slip right through the horns. And in doing so, that you can see the, um, uh, I forgot what the trigger is at the moment for the pollen, but the bee goes right by it and capture and the, gets the pollen right on its back, does the same thing again and affects pollination. So these flowers, as long as big and waxy as they look, they only last about two or three days, typically in flower. Beautiful thing, I love this fringes. This is a Siva Kingia, one of about 16 species. This Colombian species is called Rickenbachiana. The plant looks very much like a small Stenopia um, and it's beautiful. Again, just a few day flower, but um, once all of these plants, all anything in this tribe, if you get a good sized plant, you'll get spikes over a series of weeks. It isn't all at once. So that's, a, that's one saving feature for people who don't like um, ephemeral flowers. Uh, Paphinias was a favorite genus of mine before I stopped growing in warm under lights. Paphinia went from five species when I started orchids to again about 16 species. This one has the largest flowers. If these flowers were flat, they hang down the way they do, but if they're flat, they'd be a foot across. Paphinia, Her Paphinia herere is typically red and white. This is a very uncommon albino form, albiform form of this species. Um, the bucket orchids, I could go into this, just another one of these amazing pollination strategies. Uh, the bucket, well, I should go a little bit into it. The bucket secretes the flower, the lip secretes the fluid into the bucket. The bees, again, trying to collect wax of the female, they try to collect, collect it, they slide down to the bucket, they cl can't climb out, it's too waxy. They have to push their way through the, so on the flower on the right, it's the lowermost right part of the bucket. The one on the left is the lowermost left part of the bucket. The bee finally finds the hole to get out, like a soldier under barbed wire, he pushes his way through. And when he does, he picks up the pollen. 
I guess at some point he goes, wow, that was great. I'm going to do that again. And he affects pollination. So it's amazing. These flowers open so quickly. Once the bud cracks in about a half an hour, the flowers completely open and starting to look like it's withered, although it's still completely fresh. This is the, one of the largest ones. Coranthes macrantha. This is anachise plant. The flowers are about four inches each. Peristeria a lot of this is a, uh, a thing that this and two other genera were part of the Stanopian eye. Now they're in a, a different section called the uh, um, a different group called the Celiopsinae. Anyway, the Peristeria is in this one is the national flower of Panama, has a, a, a pseudobulb the size of a large cantaloupe. It grows terrestrially, terrestrially has large uh, three foot meter long pleated leaves and an inflorescence that can go up to four feet long each flower. It's also called the Holy Ghost Orchid because of the little dove in the center of the flower. Bulbophyll dummy. This is way too long. Sorry, folks. I'm trying to speed it up. Bulbophyll is one of the largest genera also. Probably again, close, probably between 1,500 and 2,000 species when all is said and done. It's a complex of probably many genera that have been put together because they don't know how to define them. This is one of the seropedalum types. This is a yellow form, a straw colored form of the common species Bulbophyll amesianum, Forma striminium. Cute little thing, it looks like a little spider in the center. This is part, of, or it could be the genus Epicreanthes if they do keep it. But right now it's a bulbophyllum, phyllum and it's called Flavo Fimbriatum. Little flowers on a long pendant chain like plant. Very cool. This is my plant of an Australian species that all the flowers bloom in mass in the wintertime, right along the rhizome. This is bulbophyllum Schillerianum. Really weird thing. It's one of most bulbophyllums have a, I should have said, have a two have a single leaf pseudobulb, but there's a group of deciduous species, a couple groups of deciduous species, for whatever reason, they have a paired leaves. And Judy Carney grows these quite well, as do some other members. And this is called Lemnus getoides. It's, um, so each one of those, each one of those, every three tails constitutes a flower. Each flower has three long tails. So these are ridiculously small. The, the tails are called pallier. They blow in the wind, they attract the pollinator which I didn't say again also that most bubble films smell pretty bad. So the pollinators are usually flies, carrying flies or such, and they affect pollination by, by uh, doing what they do with flowers. This one is not a beauty. I threw it in because it is so weird. This, is, this inflorescence is a, uh, if you look at it just towards the apex, a few of them look like they have their lids lifted up. Those are the only open flowers on this inflorescence. The, in front of that are the buds and everything behind it's already finished blooming. This is an, uh, a Madagascar endemic and like so many things in Madagascar, both flora and fauna. It's strange, weird, and endemic. Nothing rare about this, but just so weird. This is bubble filling medusae. Each one of those, each three of those tails constitutes a flower. Um, easy to grow, easy to come by, warm growing, makes specimens, but still marvelous. Um, don't try to comb your hairs on this thing because they'll tangle like you won't believe. So just leave it as it is, tangled mess. We'll film Shibelite. Jim Coots identified this for me. Andy Coots brought this to a show in San Francisco and turns out it's in the lobby I group. He didn't know what it was and I sent pictures to Jim and he knew it was Shibel, Shibelite. Interestingly, I've met Hans Shibel who has an orchid business in Australia. I've not been to it because it's further north than we've been. But anyway, I'd like to, I'd like to see it. This is a, uh, I think it's called Dark Star Orchids. Anyway, this is a, uh, one named in his honor. Beautiful thing, one of the deciduous ones, one of the paired leafed ones, the leaves drop. They rest, and I think right before they're about to grow, they, they set up their inflorescence. So it's an erect inflorescence, but the flowering part is on the descending or pendant part of the inflorescence. So it's very cool. It's like a, a thing of propellers. This is one that, uh, unfortunately, it's one of the most beautiful bubble films that was found in a national park in Malaysia, but unfortunately they have extirpated it out of the park. They've collected basically every single plant of it. So for all intents and purposes, it's extinct in the wild. So if you can get one of these, make sure it's a seed grown one because that's what happens when something beautiful is found. They just obliterate it. It's just gone from the wild. So this is called Boba Fellum Cuba Ensi. That inflorescence is about four inches long. Each of those flowers is probably about Three quarters, not quite an inch, but as you can see, it's stunning. One of Judy's plants this is bubble film camosa, one of those deciduous ones. I just love it. I just everything about it, the fringes, the look, the everything about it just it's unique to me. I just I you know anyway, this is uh these are really quite difficult to grow. Judy seems to have gotten the knack down because she's blown them year after year, so that's really cool. So last group, I swear, is the pleurothalids. Pleurothalids are a new world group of orchids. There's 
probably more than 5,000 species. If you think about that, that's probably one out of every uh, six or so orchids in the world is a pleurothalid from the new world. So anyway, as Lynn said earlier, there's about 600 species of Mastivalia. I saw this in a nursery in Colombia and I had never seen it or heard of it before. Turns out it was called Mastivalia tricolor or tricolor. And it turns out it's a form of caudata, but regardless, it's about a six inch flower. And as you can see, it's stunningly beautiful. Claudia volvula, just a weird, weird Mastivalia. This is the only one in its group, um, has these uh, symmetrically asymmetrical uh, petals. It's just a really cool thing, like a corkscrew. It's a Colombian species, a Colombian endemic, and you don't see it much anymore. I haven't seen one for years now. Mastivalia rubiola, Walter Teague, our member who passed away several years ago, about six years ago, I guess now, um, went to Bolivia and he probably shouldn't have, but he brought back a little seed pod. Turns out it was this new species, Mastivalia rubiola. Um, there are people in the Bay Area who've been able to grow it, keep it alive, but unfortunately it's been sterile. They've not been able to get any seed set on it. So anyway, it's in the sexies oscillating. It's very little wiggly tongue on it, oscillating tongue. Tails are folded behind the flowers. So those are the usual stand-up tails of most Mastivalias. Beautiful one. I got a piece of this one from John Leathers. It's a new species, probably a new species or a form of Mastivalia filaria. It's got about four inch flowers, just incredibly beautiful from Colombia. Platystele umbellata, Platystele is I think something like 120 species. This whole inflorescence, that whole head of flowers is, a, is smaller than a dime. It's a, maybe a size of a dime at the most. It's actually a warmer growing species. So Jonathan, you could grow this in an intermediate growing uh, a paludarium if you wanted to try it, be a good candidate for that. Anyway, each one of those little yellow things again is the pollen cap. Pleurothallus, large genus of a couple hundred species or more. It's been reduced in size from the segregation of genera into other, you know, other genera. But anyway, Pleurothallus marthae is a large stately plant. Each plant is probably about 16 or more inches tall, maybe 18 inches. It has this head of flowers. Each of those flowers is about two inches. It's a Colombian endemic and I think one of the most choice species in the genus. Plurthas liniana, it's named for Lynn O'Shaughnessy. It's an Ecuadorian species. I did see one in the wild in bloom, but it was quite chewed up. So I didn't recognize it until later when I started thinking about what it was. Anyway, this is my plant of Plurthas liniana, fairly new in the market, at least in the last 10 years. People just scoff at Stellus, and maybe I just like this photo, but there's about a thousand species of Stellus. And when you say, what's a Stellus? Everyone goes, I don't know, just a Stellus. So that's what everyone thinks of Stellus. Well, I guess I just like the picture, but it's a Stellus butcheri from Panama. It's the for Harry Butcher, a friend of Lil Severance. For those of you who remember Lil, he was our guide when I went to Panama, Costa Rica in 1982 and 83. He was, he was old then and he, he didn't last much longer, but what a guy. Uh, something that some segregates, this was a prothallus, is Stellus superpedioides. I won't go into it, but this is probably the true one with the purple hairs on long pendant spikes, sequential flower, which is few spread out flowers. Um, very cool little plant though. Lepanthes, wonderful genus of about a thousand species also. Um, this one is uh, what Jonathan, I think, showed this in his paludarium talk. Um, this is one that actually, it's not a cool grower. You want to grow it intermediate at least, can even grow warm. I found one in Colombia that's quite warm where it was. Uh, so anyway, but what's so beautiful about it is the foliage and the flowers. It's everything going for it. It's a beautiful, beautiful plant. Um, Lepanthes capromulgus. Turns out that this is probably going to be a new species. Capromulgus, the only one we know of that's truly capromulgus is the clone gorgeous goobers. This one is an, uh, it was a new collection about 10 years ago out of Peru. It turns out it's not quite the same, but anyway, I'll have to change that when they get the name for the new one, but it's quite a rare uh, species, brand new species. Beautiful one, Aculeata means spiny. It's not sharp, those are soft spines on the back of the leaves, but pretty cool looking. I love Lepanthes for the colors, the shape, the, they're just amazing to me. Yes, they're small, but you know, so is that jewel on your ring in your finger. Lepanthes felis is a beautiful thing. This is a one, I always wonder why it's called the cat. Well, somebody said, well, look at the flower upside down. Ah, I can kind of see it now. So it's a very variable species. I actually got to see one in the wild at Tataman National Park in Colombia. Saw a few of them. Anyway, great thing. Those green things in the center of the hood, those are the petals. And that tiny little bit is the, is the lip. That little thing in the lip in the columns, that tiny little thing in the center there. Lepanthes felis. Last genus, Dracula Chestertonii, it's just remarkable. Draculas, there's about 120 species, I think, roughly. Um, there are ten, typically uh, pendant flowers, pendant inflorescences, there are a few erect flowers, but the flower, erect inflorescences, but the flowers tend to hang down. They have this mushroom-like lip because, they, and they smell, they give off a fungus-like smell, a fungoid smell, 
because they're fall, pollinated by fungus gnats. So um, anyway, Chester Tony has one of the largest lips uh, in proportions of the flower. This is a Colombian endemic, about a three inch flower. Fairly new species, not that long known, is Dracula saulii from Peru. It's named after Saul, who works for Peru Flora. And uh, this is named in his honor. Beautiful little thing. Um, yeah, just I like the picture. Dracula Robodora, it's got about a five inch flower, one of the most stunning of the Draculas, fairly flat flower. Um, and another thing, most of the species have a hinged lip, but there are a few that don't have a hinged lip. They have a, 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 a non motile lip, like Dracula Chimera as a non hinged lip. So it's one of the ways you tell some of these similar species apart. Anyway, Dracula Le Fleuri has very rare, hardly anyone has it. It's got about nine inch flowers, stunningly beautiful. Um, Dracula collectors love to get this one. Um, when they're serious, they usually can find a division of it. But anyway, you don't commonly see this one at all. And Dracula Vampira, this uh, John Leathers is able to get a 14 inch flower on his plant of Dracula Vampira. Bella Lugosi, as you can tell, someone got smart with that name. Anyway, this is a, a got an FCC from the AOS, a first class certificate from the AOS, one of the most stunning orchids there can be. And lastly, these are my two friends, Dracula Presby saying, thanks for putting up with that because I know I went on, I tried to talk fast, but anyway, thank you very much. Any questions? I know probably ran out of time. Yeah, you did great. Don't worry about it. <clears throat> yeah, oh, bravo. It's Yay. keep people strong hanging in there, right? So, yeah. Very <laughs> interesting. <laughs> right? Very interesting. And yeah, look on, look. Beautiful. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Because I'm going to bail pretty soon. <laughs> but I'm here for questions. Anything you want to ask is good. Okay. How do you separate Cymbidium nanulum from Cymbidium encephalium? What's that, Jim? How do you separate Cymbidium nanulum from Cymbidium encephalium? It has no leaves. It, has, it comes oh, out okay. of the ground. Right. It's, okay. it's, yeah, it's a saprophyte. Okay. Very similar to Encephalium. Yeah. in the Philippines recently. What's that? We found two of those in the Philippines recently. Oh, really? Yep. New That's species. Cool. So you found Encephalium there or you found a... Uh, That's a been there for a long time. You want to come over? Okay. No, we found some of the ones without leaves. Oh, excellent. Wow. You to put your stuff in there. That'd be in your book there, Jim. One it. looks like Mac Verizon, but the other oh, one's yeah. different. Huh. That's amazing because Mac Verizon's from India, yeah. Come on, someone's got to have some question. How did how, how, how turn your thing off? Sorry. <laughs> was that Sam? Was that Sam Watman? Okay. All right. Did you? Yeah. How how did the plants grow with, without uh, what, what, chlorophyll? without chlorophyll? Are they Are they they tend to they they, uh, they 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 tend to derive. Um, from broken down materials, they tend to, or they can even, even most orchids are actually parasitic in the, in the embryonic stage, they parasitize the fungus. Somehow, I guess some orchids uh, just carry that further and that's their life, that's their life, uh, I don't know what the word is, but they're, they're sacrificed. So like mushrooms and stuff, I guess they are from, they derive, that's a good question there, Sam, but I think they derive their nutrients from um, uh, broken down materials in the ground. Oh. All right, are we ready yeah. to move to show and tell us to give Ron another round? It was of awesome, Ron. Awesome. Thank you, Lynn. Great job. Thank you. All right, guys. Wonderful, Take care. Ron. I'll see you next time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ron. All yeah. right. So the Bye. final, I'm going to stop the recording here.